Okay, I would like to start by thanking the organizers for inviting me to give this talk and this opportunity to speak about my work. Uh, the work I'll be talking about today was performed in collaboration with two graduate students in Johannesburg, uh, Narina Hassini, Tahir Dimbisoa, and Christopher Mathwin. And it's based on an archive paper that appeared last week. So, so the background for this work is that at this stage, the, there's been dramatic progress in calculating the spectrum of anomalous dimensions in the large end limit of planar n is equal to 4 super Yang null theory. In fact, at this stage, we can consider this to be a solved problem, and that's thanks to integrability. What I would like to do in this talk is to start studying the spectrum of anomalous dimensions of heavy operators, and by this I mean operators that have a bare dimension of order n. And I'm going to try to argue it's an interesting problem. I'm going to try to argue we can make some progress on this problem. And I'm just going to try to give you a sketch of the kinds of techniques that we've been developing to deal with this. So first of all, why is this an interesting question? So I'm going to take my clue from the half BPS sector. Uh, so what I've plotted here is the bare dimension of the operator. And in the half BPS sector, we understand this very, very well. So if you start off with operators with a dimension of order 1 or order root n, this is where the planar limit applies. So when you're focusing on the planar limit, you're studying things down here. And what you're studying in the dual gravity are strings and gravitons. As you increase the dimensions of the operators, until you get to a dimension of order n, the kinds of things in the gravity that you're studying includes giant gravitons. And if you went even further to order n squared, you would actually start to study new geometries, uh, for example, the LLM geometries for the half BPS sector. If you wanted to write down some sort of an operator that was dual to a black hole, you would be sitting somewhere up here. So I think that there's lots of reasons why it would be interesting to actually study this particular limit of the theory. Now, to give you some insight into this limit, uh, I want to compare it to the planar limit and show you some differences. So one key difference is in how operators mix. So in the planar limit, uh, if you have multi-trace structures and they're different, the operators simply don't mix. So I'm going to illustrate this in the simplest possible example. I'm ignoring all space-time dependence. What's important for me here is the color combinatorics. And I've considered a two-point function of a single trace operator built only using Z daggers and a double trace operator built only using Zs. These factors normalize the two-point functions to be one. If, so if I calculate this two-point function of the single trace with this double trace operator, there's the result. And if I hold J1, J2, and J3 fixed as I take n to infinity, this right-hand side vanishes. If, however, I allow j1, j2, and j3 to scale, then naively, when j is of order n to the two-thirds, the right-hand side becomes of order 1. And in fact, I've got mixing between different multi-trace structures. I'm interested in the case where the j's are all of order n. If the j's are of order n, this right-hand side is huge, and there's completely unconstrained mixing between the different multi-trace structures. And it wouldn't make sense to restrict yourself to one particular trace structure. This is already going to change the story dramatically from the planar limit. The way integrability was found in the planar limit was to map the dilatation operator into the Hamiltonian of an integrable spin chain. And this relied on two things. Number one, there's a bijection between single trace operators and states of the spin chain. But secondly, when the dilatation operator acts, because there's no mixing between single traces and other multi-trace structures, the dilatation operator has a closed action on single traces. It only takes single traces into single traces. That'll no longer be the case. So the spin chain language and restricting to single traces is not going to be a useful description for us. We'll need to come up with some other description. Two other differences, important differences. So I'm going to illustrate this when I take n is equal to 2. So I'm looking at a 2 by 2 matrix. In this case, there are two eigenvalues. So if I'm looking at traces, after I know the value of the trace of z and the value of the trace of z squared, I know the value of any other trace. So in particular, this equation here expresses the trace of z cubed in terms of the trace of z and the trace of z squared. This is known as the trace relation. It tells you that not every uh, uh, trace operator you write down is independent. When does this start to be a problem? Well, here you could see it was for z cubed. In general, it'll be a problem as soon as the number of fields is greater than n. And we're interested in the case where the anomalous dimensions are of order n, so we may have 3n fields or 4n fields or something like that. This is something we're going to have to take into account. And what we're going to need to do is we're going to need to make sure that we write down a set of operators that is complete but not overcomplete. So how do you do that? The last comment actually relates to how we count powers of n. 
So you're used to taking a look at the ribbon graph and thinking about the surface that that ribbon graph triangulates. And then to get the powers of 1 over n, you look at the genus of the ribbon graph. And that's the only source of n-dependence. Because of that, higher genus diagrams are suppressed, and you only need to sum the planar diagrams. In our case, because the number of fields appearing in the operator is order n, when you count the number of diagrams corresponding to a particular genus, there's extra n-dependence. And you need to take into account that n-dependence. It turns out there's a lot more diagrams of higher genus than there are of planar diagrams. So the 1 over n squared suppression that usually knocks out the planar diagrams just doesn't work anymore. So in this situation, you cannot point to a specific subset of diagrams and say these are the important diagrams to sum. You need to sum everything. There, there isn't an obvious class of diagrams that dominates. So how are we going to deal with this? Well, I'm going to argue that you can deal with these problems rather effectively using an approach based on the symmetric group and using representation theory of the symmetric group. And secondly, uh, I'm going to argue that permutations actually are the natural language in which to talk about this problem. So why permutations? <coughs> well, permutations give you a very natural way to talk about multi-trace structures. So here I've got operators with different uh, multi-trace structures. What's the difference between them? Well, look at the lower indices compared to the upper indices. And you can see the difference between these two operators is how the lower indices are permuted with respect to the upper indices. And in fact, whatever multi-trace structure you've got, you can always specify the operator just by talking about how the lower indices would be permuted with respect to the upper indices. So now to talk about any multi-trace structure, we're just going to start talking about permutations. And this is going to be our language now. So a multi-trace operator composed from k fields will correspond to some permutation of the group, symmetric group SK. And uh, not every permutation gives you a distinct operator. Permutations that belong to the same conjugacy class determine the same operator. This definitely gives us a language. Is it a useful language? So I'm going to start off thinking about the free theory to uh, see what this description is like. I want to calculate a two-point function. Again, I'm ignoring uh, space-time dependence. So that's the basic width contraction. Now I want to calculate the correlation function of two operators, one of them both using nz's and one of them both using nz daggers. These coefficients sitting over here are totally arbitrary tensors. So this will span any operators built with the, the advertised numbers of z's or z daggers. To actually calculate this correlator, I mean, what do you have to do? You need to pair the z's together with the z daggers, and for each pair, replace it by the width contraction, and then sum over all possible pairings. There's n factorial way to do the pairings. Each particular pairing you choose can again be put into correspondence with a permutation. So now we see, in fact, not only do permutations give us a useful way of talking about the operator, but every width contraction you could think of doing corresponds to a permutation. And secondly, the sum over all possible permutations, so the sum over all possible ribbon graphs, can be written as a sum over all possible uh, permutations. OK. So can we do this sum? It turns out we can, and we use some group theory to do this. The permutation sigma acts on the, tensor, the space formed by taking the tensor product of n copies of z. The action of sigma on that space is reducible. So you can decompose that action into irreducible representations. If you build the projection operator that projects you onto an irreducible representation, it will obey what every projection operator does, which means it will commute with every element of the group. And if you take a product of two projection operators, you'll get 0 if they project to different representations, or you'll get your original projector back if they project to the same representation. Now let's reconsider our sum um, over permutations. So that's the sum we wanted to do. I'm going to replace A and B by these projection operators. I can slip the permutation past the projector. The sum becomes trivial. The product of the two projectors that's remaining also becomes trivial. So I'll end up having to calculate the trace of a projection operator, but that just gives me the dimension of the space to which I project. So in fact, it turns out the entire calculation becomes just one line. And in this line over here, I've summed over every single possible ribbon graph. I didn't just sum the planar graphs. Everything has been summed. So the operators constructed in this way uh, are called the Schur polynomials. What sits here is a character of the symmetric group. And uh, these polynomials are labeled by Young diagrams with a total of n boxes. How are the trace relations taken into account? 
if you have a Young diagram with more than n rows, that Shure polynomial vanishes identically. If you just write out the Shure polynomial equal to zero, that is the trace relation. So the Shure polynomials naturally encode the trace relations. If I consider the complete set of operators with a total of n rows or less, that gives me a basis for talking about the local operators of the theory. Um, so the natural question to ask now is, can these results be generalized to more than one matrix? And the answer is yes. I'm just going to tell you what the answer is. Here, two groups play a role. And it's rather easy to see why two groups play a role. We're building operators with n copies of z and m copies of y. When we build a general multi-trace structure, y's and z's are allowed to appear inside the same trace. So when we write down a permutation corresponding to a multi-trace structure, we need to allow permutations that swap y and z indices. So to write down the structure of the, the complete set of operators of the theory, we need to allow ourselves permutations that swap z indices and y indices. When we come to look at the weak contractions that we can perform here, we can only contract z's with z daggers and y's with y daggers. So we can still put the weak contractions into correspondence with the permutation, but now there would be permutations that only swap indices belonging to z's and indices belonging to y's. So to some Sn times Sm subgroup. So in the end, the polynomial is labeled by a representation of Sn plus m, a representation of Sn, and a representation of Sn. Now, if you specify these three Young diagrams, you still don't get a unique operator. So you need to specify some additional labels. And these multiplicity indices alpha and beta distinguish between different operators labeled by the same Young diagram. What sits here is actually it looks very natural. It's not a character, but it's a restricted character. I'm restricting the row and column indices of the trace uh, to some copy of the subgroup. Um, what one can prove is that the restricted Shore polynomials define a basis. You'll again have trace relations in this case. And the trace relations are captured by writing down uh, the statement that the Shore polynomial is equal to 0 if any of the Young diagrams have more than n rows. So in this case, it gives you a way of capturing the trace relations when you've got more than one matrix in the game. The Shaw polynomials are, diag uh, are uh, diagonal on all of their indices. And there's a relatively simple formula telling you how to express any multi-trace operator in terms of the restricted Shures. Everything that we've said now, oh, so there's one more restricted Shure that I would like to consider. And uh, it's defined as follows. I will still have the z sitting here. I'll still have a restricted character. But what I will sandwich in here is not just a single field y, but I'll sandwich in some composite word built by composing a number of the fundamental fields. I will uh, want to talk about this state later on. And when I do it, um, I will always refer to the number of z's by the first letter here. So there's n z's. They sit there. And I will refer to the numbers in these braces as telling me about this uh, word w. And I will often want to consider operators with one, more than one word w. When I want to calculate these correlation functions in large n, the planar limit makes an interesting reappearance. Because when calculating these correlators, I need to sum all possible contractions between the z fields. But when I contract corresponding uh, words w, I need only sum the planar contractions for those. And that'll give me the correct large n limit for the correlation function. Uh, I would like to interpret these operators in the dual gravity. So I'm going to talk about that now before I start including interactions. So to, to talk about them in the dual gravity, it is most useful to use um, the coordinates introduced by uh, Lynn Lunen and Maldacena. So there's a plane on which you specify your boundary conditions for any LLM geometry. You can project to this plane. And uh, when you've got this plane, at least for energy eigenstates, you can view this as a, a half EPS centrifuge. So what I mean by that is, if you look at the radius in the plane, it tells you exactly the structure of your operator. So if you're at the origin of the plane, you're talking about a maximal giant graviton. As you move away from the origin of the plane, the graviton gets smaller and smaller. You move further from being a maximal giant graviton. At the radius r is equal to 1, you will have point gravitons circulating. And if you go beyond the radius r is equal to 1, you get dual giant gravitons. The way that our operators are translated into a system of giant gravitons and open strings is that the first label of the operator tells you what the system of giant gravitons is. If you have a Young diagram with long columns, for each column you have a giant graviton. If there are long rows, 
for each long row, you have a dual giant graviton. The number of boxes in the column and the row determine the momentum of the giant graviton. Then we need to specify how we will restrict the row and column indices of the trace in the restricted trace. And what happens is each of these open string words correspond to a box inside the Young diagram. And dropping the boxes in this specific order as labels tells you precisely how the open strings are attached to the giant graviton. And I'll be giving you evidence in detail that these operators really are dual to these string theory states. But up to now, I've simply described all of the states in the free field theory. A natural thing that you might ask at this stage is what happens when we move beyond the free field theory? And in particular, we're going to focus on what is the action of the dilatation operator. So there's this nice formula for the dilatation operator acting in the SU2 sector. And many of our calculations was done just taking the dilatation operator and applying it to the restricted Shaw polynomial and seeing what the result is, just explicit computation. But, but you can give a couple of general arguments. So, so there's a general argument just by looking at the Feynman diagrams that tells you if you're working at L loops, at most L boxes in the Young diagrams labeling the operators can change. So if you're working at one loop and the two restricted Shaw polynomials you have differ by the placement of more than one box in their labels, those two operators will not mix. So the mixing of different restricted Shaw polynomials is very highly constrained. So this is an indication that it's a good basis to start in if you want to solve uh, the mixing problem. Um, another comment is just when you evaluate this action, there's a rather simple expression for the expression uh, for the action of the dilatation operator. And all that we will use is the factors of the Young diagram. So let me just remind you of what the factors of the Young diagram are. So you start off in the topmost and rightmost or leftmost box, you put an N. And every time you move across, you add one. Every time you move down, you subtract one. And these numbers have a, a lot of meaning in the UN representation theory. They're going to play a role. So now I'm looking at the labeling where I indicate my giant momentum and my magnon positions, the positions of these Ys. And I simply want to evaluate the action of my dilatation operator on this state. So this first result is just meant to orient you. Um, if you look at the operator here, the blue Zs are part of the uh, giant graviton. What sits under this black brace is the open string word W. And when I'm talking about a bulk magnon, I'm talking about a Y field sitting in the middle. The boundary magnons are what sit on the outsides. Now, to calculate the large end correlation function of this operator, I only need to sum planar contractions for the open string words. So here you should recognize the planar dilatation operator's action. And what you see is acting on this state, so I'm acting on the middle magnon, so the 1x2, so acting on the state, I get precisely the same state back with a factor of 2, or the states back with a minus sign where the magnon has shifted one position either to the right or the left. And this is exactly the Heisenberg Hamiltonian that you saw in the previous talk. So that's the action of the um, dilatation operator on the bulk magnon. Now what happens when we act on these boundary magnons? When we act on the boundary magnons, in fact, we start to interact with the Zs that belong to the giant graviton. So this is the first time where you have to sum a whole lot of non-planar diagrams. And the effect is really rather simple. So it looks the same. You get back a state where the, mag the, where the, the boundary magnon hasn't changed and a state where the boundary magnon has shifted by one position. But the coefficients of the different states have changed. And that number C that appears there is the factor associated to the box, associated to the endpoint of the open string. So after you've got the labeling for the operator, there's a completely explicit and simple formula that you can write down for the dilatation operator. So we want to now diagonalize this dilatation operator. That can be done rather easily just by doing a discrete Fourier transform. One thing I should comment here is these M1s and M2s tell us the position of the magnon. And the way that the state was constructed is you cannot tell exactly where the giant ends and where the open string begins. Because of that, there's an extra symmetry. If I shift all of the magnons up by one unit, the state doesn't change. And you can see that explicitly here. Things only depend on M1 minus M2. Because of that symmetry, this state vanishes unless it has a total zero momentum. So Q1 must be equal to inverse of Q2. The zero momentum constraint came about in the single trace sector by cyclicity of the single traces. Here it's got a different origin, but we'll see it's actually crucial for us to get the correct result. So this zero momentum constraint will play an important role. So if I now just consider a giant graviton of momentum n, and I plug in the value for the factor of the Young diagram, 
That's the answer that I get for a boundary magnon, and that's the usual answer for the bulk magnon. That factor in the square bracket and that factor under the square root are um, what has, that's the result of summing all of the non-planar diagrams. Um, just a few comments. The eigenstates enjoy an SU22 squared symmetry. The SU22 squared has a single central charge. Each magnon actually transforms in a central extended representation of SU22 squared with a total of three central charges switched on. So when you combine these representations for the different magnons, you have to make sure that you combine them in such a way that two of the central charges are switched off. The way that those two central charges get switched off is precisely by the zero momentum constraint. So the zero momentum constraint is rather important to get an eigenstate with the correct symmetry property. Okay, so let me stop here and I now want to talk about the dual string solution. So we're gonna think about our dual string solution using our half BPS centrifuge. So these Zs here belong to the giant graviton. So the giant graviton will be orbiting on some circle. The Zs that sit between the magnons, there's far fewer of these. So these behave like point gravitons. They orbit on a circle of radius one. So if I draw this on the LLM plane, that's where the blue Zs would have sat. And all of the Zs in between the magnons sit on this circle of a radius equal to one. Each red line corresponds to a magnon, one of the Ys. So in, in the, the advantage of looking at the LLM plane in the string theory description is that you can argue, following uh, Maldathen and Hoffman, that the SU22 central charges are given geometrically. You simply look at each uh, line segment corresponding to a given magnon, you interpret that as a complex number, and that gives you the value of the central charge. If you take now the formula for the energy of the magnon and expand it, this mod k squared, which is essentially the length squared of the magnon, should be what you compare to the one loop result from the gauge theory. Again, just to set orientation, if you have a bulk magnon, if that angle there is theta, <coughs> the, the length of the magnon would be two sine theta over two, so the length squared would be four sine squared theta over two, and with a little bit of manipulation, you reproduce the energy for a bulk magnon. If we now look at the boundary magnon, we have to consider the length of uh, a magnon stretching from r is equal to one to the radius on which the giant graviton moves. And this is the diagonal of an isosceles trapezium. To get the length squared of the diagonal of isosceles trapezium, you multiply the lengths of opposite sides and sum them. So you would get one minus r squared plus four r sine squared theta over two. The r there's the radius on which the giant graviton is moving in the LLM plane, and that's set by the angular momentum of the giant. So plugging in the value for r, we get these expressions over here, and you can see that's identical to the gauge theory result. Uh, so in particular, the terms that are in red here are what the non-planar diagrams that we had to sum to, to reproduce this answer. Um, in fact, using the SU22 invariance, you can calculate the S matrix for the scattering of bulk and boundary uh, magnons. Um, you can compare that S matrix to the weak coupling result. There's perfect agreement, so the S matrix makes sense. But if then you go ahead and you say, well, how do the central charges change in the scattering? A big difference to the planar limit is that the scattering is not elastic. And because the scattering is not elastic, the S matrix that we find does not obey the Young-Baxter equation, so the system is not integrable. How much time do I have left? Three more minutes, okay. Um, so we also calculated the action of the dilatation operator on restricted shores, where we don't use an open string word. We only have these simple Y fields in place. And let me just uh, tell you how does it look. This was a calculation done in the gauge theory with no input from the string theory. So, so what we did was we wrote down the full set of operators, in some cases maybe 300 operators, something like that. We calculate the dilatation operator and at first we diagonalize them numerically. What you notice from these sort of experimental results is that the different uh, operators of a good scaling dimension can be labeled by graphs of this type. The number of nodes in the graph tells you how many long rows or columns, so you would think about that as the number of giant gravitons. And there's some directed edges uh, in the graph. The number of edges corresponds to the number of Y fields inside the operator. So this uh, labeling was uh, actually detected from the numerical results. Now the labeling has a very natural interpretation in the dual string theory. Each of these giant gravitons has a compact world volume. Because it has a compact world volume, the Gauss law on the world volume will force the total charge to vanish. 
what that means is you must have the same number of open strings ending on a node as you do leaving a node. So this immediately suggests uh, brains together with open strings attached, although it wasn't put in, it's something that comes out of doing the gauge theory calculation. Um, you can read the action of the dilatation operator off this picture. So for example, here between nodes one and two, we have four strings stretching between those nodes, and we have an operator delta one, two with a coefficient of four. Between one and three, we've got two strings, there's a delta one, three with a coefficient of two. What are these delta operators? Well, here I've given a plot of what they are. So delta one, three will act on the Young diagram, um, moving boxes around only between rows one and row three. There's one state that comes back which looks exactly the same. There's one state that comes back where you move a box from row one to row three, and one state where you move a box from row three to row one. The state that stays the same has a plus. These two states have a minus. So that's looking very similar to the action of the planar dilatation operator on a single trace, except that now it's actually the Young diagram itself that is, is being acted upon. If you uh, look at this in the large n limit, and you calculate the anomalous dimension, you're just getting the, the lengths of the magnons between the different giants. If you include back reaction, which we think this is one case where we know how to calculate one over n corrections, uh, what you get is a bunch of decoupled oscillators. It's an integrable system, but it's kind of trivial. Uh, what these motions correspond to is a situation where the two giant gravitons are extending momentum, so they come towards each other, move away from each other again, so it's some sort of a breathing mode where these different giant gravitons are just oscillating on the LLM plane. Okay, so let me come to my conclusions now. Um, so I hope I've convinced you that the combinatorics of summing Feynman diagrams and also of constructing bases for local operators can be solved using group representation theory, and this gives you a useful language to talk about the problem. I also hope I've convinced you that the physics of excited giant gravitons is ready to be explored. I think there's lots of, of questions that could be asked and that technology is getting to the point where we can actually calculate some quantities. And finally, you know, the fact that this SU22 symmetry worked, the magnon description worked, it suggests that maybe many of the lessons that we learned from the planar limit are useful here too, which is not too surprising because in certain situations, we're describing open strings as uh, compared to closed strings. Uh, thanks for your attention. Okay, so, so the length of the word always has to con ha have at most root n fields, and uh, that's so that we can justify the planar approximation that we use between the two open string words. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, the dispersion relation you got uh, in the gravity side, uh, it had a one uh, and lambda. I guess lambda is very large, but how did, okay. you, how, how did you justify the one? I mean, okay, very good. So uh, that uh, formula for the energy of the single magnon actually follows from supersymmetry. So if you're looking at the SU22, the magnon sits into a short representation of SU22, and that formula for the energy is the formula for one of the central charges. So that, that's... Uh, that was put uh, by supersymmetry. It was put by supersymmetry. Supersymmetry. But you have ex you can argue that you have exactly the same representations on the two sides, so you can use the same argument on both sides. We have expanded the square root to second order and checked that the two-loop answer agrees with the second term in the square root. Sir, I just wanted to know that uh, regarding that calculations, uh, where you use the Schur polynomials and all, uh, would the little Richardson rule will be help or not? Okay. So the little wood Richardson rule will be extremely useful when you want to start calculating higher point uh, functions. Hmm. So for example, with a three point function of Schur polynomials, you can actually evaluate these exactly in the half DPS sector, and that's thanks to the little wood Richardson rule. So it, it, it has come in handy, for example, if you want to calculate um, emission or absorption of gravitons by a giant graviton, these calculations where you have two heavy states and a light state, and you want to do the calculation semi-classically, there the Littlewood Richardson rule has already played a role. <coughs>